entrepreneurship is consistent growth day in, day out. And the amount of times you surprise yourself by figuring things out and the amount of times you surprise yourself by showing up when you don't want to. I mean, it, there's never no a don't want, right? You just show up because it, if it's you and it's an expression of you, you just got to keep showing up. I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. Emily Schramm is on the show today. She is the founder of five different companies, but it hasn't always been that way, of course. She was on The Real World in 2009, and she's a personal trainer. And from that personal training career, she started adding different components to her career. And her portfolio of entrepreneurship, she now has a tea company, a gym, a backpack that she invented. She's also a podcaster. And in general, she's just pretty darn inspiring. In this episode, Emily and I talk through the various seasons of her life and what she's been through. At one point, she said she has felt like her ego was really steering the ship and that she was measuring her worth based on her business results. And it got to a point where when is it going to be enough? When is enough enough? She kept adding more and more. We talked through this concept of psychotic ambition, what that means, and the adrenaline behind it. We talk through her relationship with social media. She has more than 300,000 people following her on Instagram, how she deals with that just from keeping her mind healthy. And because Emily has so many different things going on with these different companies, she talks through juggling all of these different balls and what happens when one of the balls just gets dropped and what she decides to do from that point and what kind of sign that is to her. Our conversation starts off with Emily sharing how she even made that very first entrepreneurial step in becoming a personal trainer and what that felt like and then how that led to all of these other things. So starting from that very beginning point of the very first step. Just a reminder, the date and enrollment will be opening soon for the Renegade Brand Boot Camp. You can head to the website, renegadebrandbootcamp.com, and sign up to be notified when we announce the dates and all the information about the fall program. We tackle the most taboo topics on the Why Not Now show. Oftentimes, you're hearing guests share things they've never shared before. In the spirit of things we don't typically talk about, you should know that the Why Not Now show is supported by Poopery, the original before-you-go toilet spray. It's magic. My friends at Poopery have literally taken the smell out of you-know-what. This pure blend of essential oils stops bathroom odor before it begins. Visit Poopery.com and Why Not Now listeners get 20% off with code Why Not Now. That's all one word. And you can hear the story about poopery in our interview with founder Susie Batiste. That's Why Not Now, episode 28. Poopery is also available at Target. Emily, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me today. I'm so excited to talk. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's hop right in. 
Can you tell me about a time when you had a big decision to make and you had to ask yourself, why not now? Oh, gosh, Amy Jo, this is so big because this happens almost sometimes on the daily. Uh, But for me, when I first hear that, I think my instinct is to say, it was when I finally took the leap to start my own business. I think that was the most vulnerable position of saying, I trust myself enough to do this, but I have done that five times. So I have five startups and they all have their own team and I, it's not me managing everything, but at some point before they were created, they had to have that decision maker, which was me, say that I, I will create them. I will be the one that puts this out into the world. Kind of like that big magic moment. You know, if you if you don't do it, it will pass to somebody else and and not in a bad way. Maybe it is just timing. But I feel so called to help people just like you do. You know, when you have that itch, when you have that scratch, when you have that kind of curiosity, if you don't explore it it's a piece of you that you're not exploring. It's a side of you that you haven't even touched and you don't even know exists because you become this type of person in that creation process and in that I am brave enough to be terrified but do it anyway. You learn so much about yourself that it just has to happen. So for me, it was really saying, okay, I had no idea I was going to be a trainer. I was starting off as a personal trainer at a Globo gym And I just knew that it was, I just wanted to work with people. I wanted to help people have that superhero moment that I had when I finally figured out this whole gym thing and this whole look in the mirror and not hate yourself thing. It was just so liberating that I knew I had to tell other people, but it was also, I was doing it under somebody else's watch that I I didn't have a lot of respect for, right? We were in a globo gym, lots of dudes, lots of people coming in and out the door, lack of commitment and nothing that was really keeping people there because it was so turnkey. It was just a huge globo gym. And I was like, I don't, this environment isn't what I want to be in. I don't want to be developing as a trainer and developing as an entrepreneur in this setting. And I know that I can do it on my own. And it did take a couple people. I mean, even my manager was like, you know, you could totally do this on your own. So it definitely took support of other people. But it also said, you know, for me, I was like, why not? What What's the worst that can happen? You know, I have enough clients that will at least support me in a way that I can do this for you know, maybe part-time if I need to pick up another part-time job. I'm okay washing dogs. I'm okay waiting tables. Um, I'll do Mm -hmm. anything it takes (laughs) to make sure that I can pay the bills, but I will never know unless I just try it. And it definitely was terrifying because the money was not there, but it showed up. It definitely followed once I said, I can't actually imagine even staying here one day longer. Like I feel claustrophobic. I feel like now that I've made that decision and now it's kind of in my head, there's no turning back. Like this absolutely has to happen and the band-aid just got to rip off. So that was my biggest step because it didn't just, it wasn't just about physical transformation. It wasn't just about, you know, being brave and starting my own business. It was like this declaration to the universe that I was ready for anything that came my way, even though I had no idea what I was doing. Oh, that's such a great description. I, thinking back to leaving my corporate job and literally driving out of the parking lot, and that's what—that's exactly what you're basically doing. Is you're saying, okay, I trust myself to do this, and it's Bambi legs. But then it was a snowball effect for you, really. I mean, five startups, and when you think about that very first step, was the first one the hardest? Totally. Yeah. I mean, it really was, and. It, it had so many ups and downs with it. And, you know, luckily it was like a people business, right? You're with people, which kind of gives you this element that no matter what, it's kind of like a good cup of coffee with somebody. So as a trainer, when you're just starting off, you just at least you see this tangible energy that comes from that. So I do think that's the best part when you're really stepping off to do what you do. When you have that passion and purpose because you care about it enough to do it on your own, it's this very like energetic exchange, which kind of keeps you up even when everything else is down. And so nothing was good. Like, you know, had no idea where my clients were going to come from, had no idea where I was going to train when there was classes at the gym. You know, I luckily had a gym that opened up the uh, gym for hours that there weren't classes. But most people wanted to train during classes. So there was a lot of figuring out things and improvising and having a lot of trust 
uh, having clients trust me basically with a lot of things that they just didn't know the answers. I didn't know the answers to, but then you realize everything is, I think, who is it that says this? Everything's figure outable. Like you can really improvise anything. And as soon as you realize that, like we have such a skill set that we don't put into practice in our current environment usually, but when you get out of that environment, you will survive. You always will. You you will find ways to make it work. And so as soon as you start to see that, there's nothing that is terrifying anymore. So it was kind of like, okay, well, I now have this idea for a backpack turned weight training bag. I want to create something that people at home can learn how to strength train. And as they get stronger, they don't have to buy more dumbbells. They can just add more water weight. And so this idea, kind of the same idea of like, should I start my own business? It was like, oh, well, why not? Like, let's just see what happens. And everything is becomes this kind of let's just see, you know, if it fails, it fails. And then if it does fail, you're going to learn so much about your audience, about your clientele. And then for me, what I learned is myself. How do I respond to things? What are my weak points? And then what are my strengths? And then who do I need around me as I grow my team to complement that? So, I mean, nothing has been a failure because if it technically quote unquote failed, or if I lost money on it, or if I made a bad decision, you know, a year later, or sometimes five years later, it pays off in some way. It's like, ah, oh, mm-hmm. that's why that's why I had that lesson. <laughs> Thank you for that. Because <laughs> it could be, I mean, we're going to learn the lesson in some way at some point in our life, right? So uh, it's just saying I'm, I choose to learn it a little bit faster and sometimes that hurts a little bit more, but it, it makes you just so resilient. Oh, totally agree. And it's, it's interesting how you phrased it with with first taking the leap of the window and the, the span of time where you felt like that window was going to close and you had to take advantage of that opportunity or just I kind of call it a moment of bravery. We have to follow those during that moment because it may pass and then you find yourself a year later uh, before maybe another one comes, hopefully not, yes. but yeah, that window is so key and it's a feeling it's, it's completely like a physiological feeling too. I love it. And, and so you have the MPAC and you have your tea, your podcast, and all of these are, you said are operating separately and they have their own teams. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of my team, you know, it's been really fun because, um, starting off doing personal training and then online training very quickly about seven years ago, I just kind of intuitively like, let's not say the same thing over and over. Let's try to put these in videos. And so I was lucky enough to kind of catch that train before it really became saturated. And so I found these clients that also became so familiar with the work that I was doing. And then also, so like, it was this really organic way of growing my team where instead of just posting a job listing, it was posting to clients that had been with me since day one saying, Hey, I need someone to help me with social media. Hey, I need someone to help me with newsletters. And so it really organically grew. And so they kind of know a little bit about all the businesses, which is great because like, you know, I managing it, I don't suggest this to anybody, right? I like having five things is as much as I am proud of them and I love them and I want them to grow organically on their own. It's not something that I really recommend. I think, you know, there's definitely something to be said about finding the thing that you love and creating it and knowing the people that can bring on quickly to help it stay sustainable. And so that I feel really blessed with because that the people that were able to come on, they were users. They were either former clients, they were former uh, the MFIT challengers, which I have this 21 day program. They had gone through it and something really clicked with them. And so it wasn't just picking people saying like, Hey, jump on. This is what I'm doing. It's people that really believe in that vision. And so it grows together. And so we definitely have a lot of things going on, but the people are what make it possible. And I think that has been when I have those, you know, those dark days, you just said like those brave moments. When I have those brave moments, you know, we are rallying, but the most important are the, the very, oh shit moments where you're like, I have nothing in me. I have nothing left to give, but the team around you, they've been with you for so long, or they've at least been a part of it in some way to know that the purpose is something that they will help carry when you're at your lowest. And so that's just been really cool to see. And as I grow as a boss and an entrepreneur, 
understanding, you know, I'm used to kind of doing this all on my own. And as the team grows, it really is just communicating and connecting and finding those like-minded people that have the skill set that you don't have that complement you really well. I love how you took your community culture and kind of recruited and it makes total sense. They know you, they believe in you and what you have to offer and we're able to use it as a as a hiring pool really and, and a team building uh, resource. It's like you're recruiting. Um, and that culture, you know, the culture coming with it. So they already have a taste of what to expect and the purpose and the mission, and then they're just kind of hopping the fence a bit. So that's so smart. And I think it's something we forget as entrepreneurs of using social media or using a private Facebook group or whatever it may be, your online community, if you're teaching courses of some sort, as a place to to seek talent and to be you know, really mining for it. So yeah, I feel really lucky with that because I, one thing I've noticed is that in something that everyone, I just hope knows this, like you never know what to expect, right? So if you're new, if you're just starting out, you have, you can have it all on paper, look a certain way and you can kind of fill the gaps with the right resumes and the right team. And there's definitely a place for recruiting professionally and outside of your network when you're really ready for it. But I, I think for me, when you're still so in this startup question mark phase, what are we, who are we, who is our people? You know, there's definitely the first few companies I have, we have that identity in place, but there's a couple that like, we just opened a gym in Denver. So as this gym opens in Denver, you know, what is our audience? What is really speaking to them? And as you're figuring that out, the hardest thing that sometimes happens is you bring someone on that is just seeing it from an outside perspective. And so when you look at how to grow and how to really reach the people you want to reach, that comes from the people you've already reached out to. They have the most valuable feedback for what you're missing and what you could do more of to get the right types of people in the door. Because it's just, it's not necessarily mass amounts of people. It's just the right types of people. I'm not everyone's cup of tea, but the people that like me and I am their cup of tea, I want them to really resonate with what I say. So it's just something that has been a blessing in disguise for sure. It's really interesting with when I look at, you know, you have this portfolio of different companies and it's really you that is the face of everything. And correct me if I'm wrong, but how does that feel to you? You know, being the the brand, I mean, I'm using air quotes here because personal branding is such an interesting, complicated term. Are you happy with how the, you know, how this the setup is working for you or do you feel like sometimes there's too much pressure on one person? Mm, that's such a great question. So when I, you know, I have um, a big, big vision and it's really hard to let go. So for me personally, I know that I am required to kind of get some of these off the ground, but I also know that three of the five are so stand alone without me that I just have to get them there. They are basically these little birds that are like, okay, when you're ready to fly, I am really ready for you to fly, right? So it's this, I know I created them and I know that they are moving in this direction, whether it's the MPAC or the T's, like they fill a hole that I clearly have hit the mark on, right? They're a product that people love and like, and regardless of ways to improve, we know we have a great core product, whether it's the T or the backpack, that works. So it's saying right now I am the prime influencer, right? There's, mm-hmm. it's I'm not just the influencee, I am the influencer. So I see this from both angles. And it, what's interesting is, yes, it totally can be exhausting, but only if I allow it. And what I found recently is it's because I'm pushing it to be ready without me. I, I'm desperately ready for it to live and breathe without me and without any of my influence to the point where I'm like pushing it too quickly, but they're so young that I, I think for me, it's just understanding patience. Patience has been so key for me to know, you know, what's the right amount of giving to this company, to this brand, how incorporated am I in these pictures and these visuals in the messaging? How incorporated am I without it feeling like it's sucking my soul? How much can I give without it feeling 
I mean, the last thing I want is for this to feel like a job. This, I love my job because it doesn't feel like a job. It feels like an expression of myself. And so when I start to fall in that line, it's so easy. It's like when you go to the gym and you overtrain, you feel way too sore and under recovered and you're not sleeping well and your results start to backfire. That is exactly what happens with when I feel too involved or when I feel too in the face of things. And my team knows that very well. Like you know, there's a limited amount of pictures I want of me. I don't want to see myself everywhere. I want, (laughs) um, you know, this is about the product and the story around the product and why I created it more so than it is about me. And so that's just the fine line of creating a startup that I know one day can be big enough to be acquired. And then in every, every Whole Foods that you walk into and in any store that you go to. So that that's what I have to have patience with. And that's just a brand new learning experience of knowing at what point is it too much, and at what point is it just the growing the growing pains that come with it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I I vision <laughs> like a surrogate, right? You are you have to be there to help <laughs> get get this thing off the ground, or like a little shuttle, like a you know when it breaks off and the space shuttle how it has its thing that that comes off, but it needs its launcher, right? Um, so. This is really interesting. I, gosh, I have so many follow up questions for you. Okay, where do I want to go next? I'm gonna take this into into a place that, that over the last 24 hours, I um, a podcast episode aired, and the guest and I talked a little bit about tiny bit about kind of psychotic ambition. She brought up this term. I'd never heard it before, and I don't know if she just kind of made it up, but. It kind of resonated with me at that level of like, oh shoot, physiologically I've totally been there where I was I was just way too intense. Um, you know, running on adrenaline, just almost like nothing else mattered. It was just so much am- ambition overpowering. And then I look at that and I had people message me and say, Hey, would you talk more about <laughs> the psychotic ambition thing because I think I have it. And I'm saying it kind of jokingly because it's just a funny phrase. But at the same time, I think it's so it's, real. It's so real. And we romanticize that hustle, that grind, that chase and grasp. And so as someone who I kind of have my own theory of I, I don't feel that way anymore myself, but I did, I definitely did at one time. A, have you ever felt that way? And if so, how do you manage or, or kind of transition into a healthier spot? Oh God, I love that term psychotic ambition because I think for me, I, I look at kind of personality tests and one of the ones that I love the most is the Enneagram. Yes. And You're <laughs> seven, right? Are I'm you seven? such a seven. Oh my God. Oh. I'm such a seven. And I think, uh, and I all, my spirit animal is a hummingbird, like anything that's <gasps> frantic and psychotic <laughs> ambition, that's me. So I have seen this play out in so many ways where it's not just me being an entrepreneur, I had no intention of owning my own business. You know, I was a really good student. I was in college, like ready to go to vet school. And when my life kind of turned around, it was just because I realized nothing was fulfilled. I had not ever felt truly happy. And the only time I felt truly happy, I remember the first time I was like in complete euphoria was when I went skydiving for the first time. And I felt the sense of freedom that I never felt. So I went after that sense of freedom and that chase of euphoria in so many ways, not just business, but in the way I operated in my exercise routine. I started competing in CrossFit because it was so intense and it was so, you know, it almost, you have to check out, you have to become a different person when you go through some of these crazy intense workouts and I was always pushing myself physically and then it really did translate when I looked at business, when I started my own business, there, there is no end in sight because it's just like, I mean, there's a proud, the flaw of humanity is that numerology there is, it's infinite. And so there is no cap on what your success can be. And I think that that intensifies the pressure we put on ourselves of, okay, well, what about more? Well, oh, we did that. Okay, let's do more. So I always say, you know, people assume you see the light at the end of the tunnel, but the light at the end of the tunnel doesn't get closer. And when I realized that it was this kind of, oh, wow, like take a moment. When Do you remember 
the feelings that you had with your clients? Do you remember the feelings you had when you created your, your first Kickstarter video? Do you remember the feelings you had when you launched your first product and you saw somebody on Instagram using it? Those feelings we we forget because we're so in this go, 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 go stage. And my body, when I launched the second company, um, the impact on Kickstarter, I also was doing a lot of other things, but still trying to run the online business and my body totally shut down. And it was this for the first time I experienced, I will like, Oh wow. I'm not invincible. I'm not a superhero. <laughs> I really thought I was. And all of a sudden I am, not able to wake up. It's taking me six cups of coffee and even then it doesn't work. And now I'm laying in bed wide awake, even though I sh- my body's saying I'm exhausted, my brain is racing. And it was this horrible cycle of adrenal dysfunction that I experienced. Mm. And for me, that was the eye opener of saying, you know, no matter what you do, no matter what your output is, no matter what your success is on paper, if your body is at the point where you're not picking up the signs and you fell off the cliff in order for you to care, how is that an example of health and wellness and well being? Um, it's, I felt like a hypocrite. And so I absolutely struggle with feeling when I'm in that flow state. I'm just so excited to create, I'm so excited to give people access to figuring out their stomach issues, figuring out their own stress levels, figuring out how they can make a high fat diet work, or maybe not a high fat diet work for them, getting them out of this kind of diet culture we live in that I just kind of go, I like go black. Like I'm like, I just see the good. I just want to create, 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 create. And it is somewhat psychotic ambition. So what I have to understand is if my body starts to rebel, whether it's, I can't wake up, I'm not sleeping. And now for me, actually, one of the telltale signs is I get really bad SI pain in my joints. And so my lower back starts to flare up and my glutes, my glute activation doesn't happen in the gym. All of these are signs like no matter what my brain is saying, my body is saying I'm not in alignment and I have to listen to that or I will totally shut down. And so I think the psychotic ambition is definitely this feeling of I want to do everything possible because I'm so passionate and excited about it. But if you're aware enough of your body the alignment of, is this actually what I'm supposed to be doing? Or is this ego? Is this somebody saying I should do this or my own self, my own lack of value in myself telling me that if I don't do it, I have no value or I'm not going to be good enough. I think it it tells you, we just have to be really tuned into those signs. And so I kind of visualized it at the end of last year, I turned 30 and I was like, okay, what did I, holy shit, this last 10 years has been such a wild ride. I can't, I had no intention of starting one business and now I have five Gosh. and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I visualize this magician, right? Juggling these, these balls, the so five balls, just juggling. And I have, I felt that psychotic ambition being juggle, 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 pass, toss, pass, toss, pass, toss. And I just felt this sense of complete euphoria that if I, am in alignment, if I am truly doing what I'm supposed to be doing and I just stop juggling, the ones that are supposed to stay there will stay there. And the ones that are supposed to drop, they will drop and they will be given to somebody else or they will be, more team members will help with me in the ways that it needs to. But I trust myself enough to know when it's time to say, hey, this, this is a great product and this is a great first step and this is wonderful, but is it truly what makes you happy? And I have to have those conversations with me myself every day. And it's always a balance. It's always a work in progress. But I I love that analogy of saying when you're truly doing what's supposed to happen and you're really expressing yourself in the way you're supposed to in this life and on this on this earth, the the body won't rebel against you. The symptoms that we get in that dysfunction are are signs that there's something off. And we just, if we listen to it, we can find exactly what we're supposed to do. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hi everyone. If you are digging this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. It just takes a moment and it means a ton to us. Also, after recording more than 100 episodes, I've created a bit of a cheat sheet on the top five things I've learned from Renegades and how they get from idea to action, from dreaming to doing. 
I will email you the downloadable PDF when you subscribe to my newsletter. Just head to amyjoemartin.com and click on connect with me. That's so good. I love the juggling reference too. And and if you stop juggling, the one, the balls that stick with you are supposed to be in the picture. And then, oh yeah, just all of that. Love it. And you hit home. I mean, when when you mentioned ego, I was like, yeah, that's, you know, the the psychotic ambition, just the term. It to me, when I think of myself in that phase and season, and I, I might come in and out of it a little bit, but there was a time when I was just full, <laughs> fully for several years on that path. And ego was was driving. It was my operating system and measuring my worth based on business results or recognition or, you know, running off of that adrenaline. It's never enough, you know. I remember now people actually saying to me, when is it going to be enough? Like, when is this? <laughs> and I, I didn't listen at the time, but now it kind of rings in my head. So thank you for sharing that because I think it's it's so relevant to entrepreneurs. We can easily get carried away and turn it up to a notch that all of a sudden there's a deficit in purpose. And that's usually why we get started <laughs> down this path to begin with, right? Yeah, oh, totally. Wow. So what's your relationship with social media? And is it healthy? Would you say, you know, what's your your history been? Because you do have quite the presence online and it's something that so many people have a love-hate relationship with. So Tell us about your world as it relates to the interwebs. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have a love-hate relationship <laughs> with it for sure. But in in a way that finally, you know, just like any, any relationship, if you stick with it long enough, you finally figure it out and you finally get to know whether it's your best friend or your sister. You know, it just takes time to really navigate it. And I think for me, I started it actually... So when I was 20, I was picked to be on a reality TV show called Real World. And I was on Real World DC. And I remember not knowing anything about social media, but they had recommended, hey, there's this thing, you should get it. It just just launched. So I remember it being, so I guess it was 2008. And I don't remember when Instagram officially launched, but it was kind of like right after Facebook was getting into everyone's household. And then Instagram was soon after. And so I, you would know those numbers so much sooner than I would have. You're my go- the social like media the guru. Next, I think 2009, 10, it really started to be embraced even more, 2011 and 12. But if you were on in, um, oh, like even 2010, 2009, that's that's early. That's early adopter. It, it felt early. So all it was was this random place for me to – share photos and I never really shared. I just, it was so, honestly, what happened was with reality TV, I had never talked about my story or my life or anything. You know, I just was like going through life as a Enneagram seven kind of go, 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 let's try new things. (laughs) And it was the first time somebody sat me in a chair and said, no, you have to sit and talk about your life. And that was so bizarre for me. It was something I hated. And I was like, oh, like I was crawling out of my skin in these interviews. But what it did is it opened me up in ways that I had never opened up before. And when I saw the benefits, of course, there's always going to be negativity when you are vulnerable, but the the positivity completely outweighed it. It was finally people seeing themselves in, hey, oh, this person isn't, you know, a certain size and, you know, has real skin and has some breakouts and crazy hair. She's not perfect. And I relate to this person. And I saw that happen enough to where I knew if I opened up myself in the way that felt okay and I didn't force it, it just felt like I could write and express myself and share the realness of my life to other people, it it helped other people. And that's all I cared about. And I was like, wow, this is, I never thought I'd have that ability. And so I started off really young, you know, just opening up about, you know, not liking myself in the mirror and finding things that helped me like myself in the mirror. And that's really what allowed me to share the story of the physical transformation, but more importantly, this internal transformation where I walked into the room differently. I shook people's hands differently. I looked in their eyes differently. I became a different person. I became the best possible version of myself because I was able to accept myself. I was able to finally feel confident in my body, not because I finally looked a certain way, but because I knew like, damn, I'm, I'm a strong person. I am able to do some really cool things. And I, I really accessed 
does that in the gym, but that's, you know, anything that makes you feel that way, whether it's dance class or whether it's great conversations or whether it's tackling something for the first time and trying out something new, like maybe going rock climbing or maybe, maybe jumping out of an airplane, whatever it is that you are terrified of, but you do anyway, it opens you up in a way that allows kind of like that hero's journey, right? It gives you this skill set to help other people break out of their shell a little bit more. Your bravery allows other people to be more brave. And that, I understood very quickly because it just, it kind of snowball, snowballed affected. And I didn't want to change anything that I did. And so my relationship with it, kind of long story of where I struggle is when it, you know, I think it's, you know, it's probably just a mirror image is when I see things that bother me in the fitness industry, I used to let it bother me a lot. I used to feel really frustrated where there's quality content and then there's not quality content. And I think it was just getting in my head of comparison and getting in my head about not ever having a system. Like my Instagram will never be perfect. I will never have one day I do a quote and one day I do a picture of a workout and one day I do a recipe because that's not how I live my life. My life is day by day and it's, you know, what do I have to focus on? What do I have to work on? And so when I start to ever get in that trap of, oh God, I should be doing this. When I start to hear the word should, especially with social media, which even though it's it's a little different because who I am is, is the brand, right? Just like you said earlier, the I am the face of the brand, but I also refuse to dilute myself by systemizing it. And I think I just accepted that. And there's times where I think people want to have something in their head that's streamlined. They want something that's organized and pretty. And I'm just not, I'm not for those people. (laughs) And I think that's what it is. It's saying I'm not for everybody and that's okay because there's somebody else that's there for them and the right people will find me just by saying the things that I want to say and doing the things that feel right in that moment. And when I overthink it, that's when it spirals out of control and I have to take some days off and I have to just kind of recalibrate, reground myself, reconnect. I definitely think I love it because it is such a really great place to access and share the programs and the strength training and the the gym and whatever it is that I'm working on. It's a great place to, for exposure, but if it consumes us, it's just like we're living in an office, right? I think it those little squares to me can feel just as claustrophobic as a cubicle in a nine to five job. And as soon as I recognize that I have anxiety when I'm picking up my phone or going to my phone, or if I feel like my habits are way too direct, like pick phone up immediately on social media, that is so unhealthy. And I I see that in my own patterns and I have to constantly be aware of it, whether it's through screen time and kind of keeping tabs on where I'm at or simply just leaving my phone at home for, you know, gosh, the best is when you just forget your phone. I mean, that's just the best (laughs) when you're like, I have no choice but to take time off. And it's liberating um, because it can so easily consume us. Yes, it can. And what a great just analogy of those little squares can make you claustrophobic and and they can be so narrowing in terms of we don't want to be boxed as human beings, right? It's just we're messy. We're a lot of things and and to have these perfect little squares and having a brand per se which I believe is really more of an essence. It's a brand can be very boxed in. You know, it's iconic. It's static and and the classic definition of branding as a marketer is something to differentiate. Well, it started with cows. We would brand cows so they didn't all get mistaken for one another, right? So it's just, it's so interesting what we've, but I, I love that you said sometimes you just put it down for a couple of days and you do a, a timeout, a little detox and that's okay. That's more than okay. That's good. If you can be that self-aware. And also, like you said, huge upsides to it. Yeah. I, I was really curious to hear your thoughts on that topic. Um, yeah. Oh, go it's ahead. tough. I mean, I, yeah, I think for me, it's knowing, you know, as soon as I, you know, for new entrepreneurs and business owners, like as soon as you can hand off that piece, the better. I think that's something that we with DMs, you know, looking at all the people that are, they're so quick to want information that 
it's this, we are rewarding the laziness in some ways, right? By constantly being available to them. And so it's this kind of going back and forth. Like we want to be available. We want to answer quickly. We want to always have uh, them. To, they, we want customers and potential customers to have access to us because we want them to make the sale in some way. But when it's coming, when it's coming from you and you're also the business owner, that is so demanding. You, I just, you leave work or you get home and it just never feels like enough because it isn't ever enough. So mm-hmm. I do think that's one of the best things as soon as you are able to, to bring someone else on to help with social media is definitely a big, a big perk. You sound like you are a master delegator. I'm just <gasps> kind of guessing. It seems like you, you really have that down, which is not always easy for, for everyone. Do you have any tips on delegating, outsourcing? Um, yeah. Yeah. Gosh, you know, it's the less, I mean, this has been a big, like really over the last three years, there was just no other option. You know, it was either like you either delegate or you fail. And I was so sick of, for me, it's this kind of personality type that I have that I want to be amazing at everything. I just, you know, I don't even compare myself to other people. I compete with myself. Like, can I be better than I was? And I started seeing that not just with the training I was doing and the, the, you know, work I was doing, it was like in business, I wanted to be the best. And i I'm not, I'm, (laughs) my brain works. I want to create, I want to put my hands on something. I get really excited about certain things and then really, really like, oh my God, don't talk to me about that. Like my eyes gloss over on certain topics of like, okay, let's organize. And there's things that I just will never be good at. And when I finally started to trust other people and that was the big piece, like really learning how to trust people. And I think it just happened it happened a little quicker for me because those people had already seen some of my work. They had already been a part of my programs or they've been a part of my life in some way. But when you realize that there's amazing people that are really good at what you're not good at, that allow you to be even better at what you're good at, then there's no question. Like You're like, oh, if I give this person my emails, my support emails that I wanted to be good at because my ego said that I should be good at it, but I'm not doing a good job because when I finish those emails, all I do is feel drained. I feel like I gave everything into every email and now there's 20 more emails that I have to answer and now I just want to go to bed. It's like, well, what if we put somebody else in between me and that customer and they're taken care of and the person is so good at what they do that I have more energy to create another program or to do a video or to film a podcast. Like seeing it, it was just a quite literal explanation of, well, do you want this to be sustainable? Do you want to do what you love? Or do you want to just keep your ego happy by pretending that you're good at everything? Um, So it's just very quickly saying, you know what? I know what I'm good at. I know what I like. And of course, this is a mat, uh, like a total, uh, I go through this every day of things. Like, I want to be so good at this. And like, oh God, I'm really not good at this, am I? <laughs> like, okay, this is, a, this is a thing. And so it's having the people around you that you trust enough. I will say the one thing that really helped because we're so head down and just doing it. We have to be. And the people in my life, you know, whether it was my boyfriend or my best friends, or my mom or my sister, what what's really cool is to ask them, or even they might mention it without even noticing, like what lights me up the most when I talk about work? Like, is it is it the challenges? Is it the tea? Is it like who the people around you will know what makes you the most excited? Because in your head, you're just doing it and you're excited about everything, but the people around you will say, that is what you really like. That's what really lights you up. And when you talk about it, your whole demeanor changes. And when you find those things, you say, okay, well, that's where the energy needs to go. And if there's anything that's not allowing that energy to go there, then you need to bring someone on to make sure that you can shift. Mm, Such a good point. And it's, I think too, a a great filter is looking at your to-do list per se. And if there's, if there are things that keep getting pushed, I ask myself, is it because of dread? I just do not like doing that. That's a good delegation uh, candidate. Or is it maybe fear? Because sometimes we just procrastinate because we're scared to do things. But it's a big lesson that I think so many entrepreneurs – are um, 
afraid to make that jump to lo- to let go of control, but they don't realize it absolutely has to be done at some point because we're only uniquely qualified to do certain things in our genius, and we have to do those. That's our differentiating factor. And the other stuff, it can it can be done elsewhere. So it's it's cool to hear you've, you've been able to do so much in such a, a quick amount of time. It's just incredible. What's one lesson that you find yourself learning over and over, Emily? Mm. Oh, that's such a good question. Well, what we what we just talked about, I think, is definitely relevant. Like, I love to create. And so it's saying, well, if you love to create and you love to create things, then what can help you? Who can help you if you're going to create something to support that? Because you can't just create and then let it go, right? You have to create and you have to have the stability and the team and the things in place to sustain it and to make sure that it is not just staying afloat, but it's thriving. And so I think it's always the lesson of patience. And I have, you know, the, if you're again, familiar with that Enneagram seven, it's kind of like impulsive and that's, that sounds pretty and that's shiny and squirrel, uh, all the things. And so it's just saying, okay, well take a step, take a breath. And it might just be a five second breath versus a one second breath. It doesn't have to be a big radical shift for me, but it's saying, what's the intention before you jump into this new program, before you jump into this new tea blend, before you jump into this new six week workout cycle, like what is the intention? And if the intention is I just need to make money. I just need to fund something. I just need to uh, see my bank account grow. Like if, if that ever is the intention, then it's never a good idea. But it's saying, if you know the intention deep down, it's just serving somebody. There was enough questions about it where it really, really makes you excited and you want other people to experience that excitement with you, then let's go for it and let's get it down and let's plan it. So I think the lesson is always a step back, patience. It's not just about creation, but it's making sure you're putting yourself in a, in a creative state that's sustainable. That's my biggest lesson. What a good uh, GPS, because like you said, the the energy will show up in the cur- in the currency of, of financial money too. If you keep that as your, your guide, your nor your, navigation system. In entrepreneurship in general, if people are listening, they're thinking about making the leap, they have an idea, they're right on that verge of taking action. Any advice you would give to them in terms of what to expect or maybe what surprised you the most? Oh, you know, I think it was just I think I'm surprising myself. Like I, I genuinely, and this is what I want everyone to feel. If they have that itch of like you, what surprises you the most is just like when you're at the gym and you can do 10 push ups and not seven, you know, you're like, wow, I just, pro- I just grew like entrepreneurship is consistent growth day in, day out. And the amount of times you surprise yourself by figuring things out and the amount of times you surprise yourself by showing up when you don't want to or showing up. I mean, there's never no, a don't want, right. You just show up because it, if it's you and it's an expression of you, you just got to keep showing up. I think it's saying that what surprised me the most is like that long-term vision of no shortcuts, no quick fixes, no quick dollars, no, like I'm going to, you know, quick, let me launch this and make a quick buck on somebody. And this sounds catchy and I'm going to do this. It's like, if you really believe in it and you trust yourself enough, the long-term game is so much more bountiful than this kind of, what can I do right now in the next month? And so you, when you first start off, you're like month to month and maybe six months and then maybe a year. And I think what surprised me the most is how, you know, starting off, if you can really find and speak your voice and that authentic expression of who you are comes out in your business and in the work that you do, it will pay off in dividends years down the road. And nobody cares about years down the road, but I think that's the thing that surprised me the most looking back, starting my first business seven years ago saying, oh my gosh, like I had no idea that picking the people or saying no to those one-off deals or those quote unquote sponsorships or 
these things that didn't feel right, if I said no to them, even though I maybe regretted it and like, oh shoot, maybe I should have said yes. If it didn't feel right, it's going to pay off. It will pay off so strongly because you're just doing what you're supposed to be doing with the right people. And then the, the tribe will come like the people that are drawn to that, that authenticity, it creates itself because you're no longer all over the place and trying everything. You're just who you are. And I think that's, what's really cool is in entrepreneurship, you find out who you are. So true. And final question, what advice would you give to your younger self? (laughs) Oh Lord. Um, ah, you know, I think, I think I've only recently in the last maybe two years have found a sense of peace with that kind of light at the end of the tunnel, right? The light at the end of the tunnel is not getting closer. And we're always in the search of getting closer to the light at the end of the tunnel. And we think we're crazy because we want it so badly, yet it's so far. And we feel like we're lacking. We feel like we're not enough. We feel like we're not doing the right things. And I think it's just saying like, hey, M, <laughs> you're like, you're never, you got to like, maybe it is that psychotic ambition we talked about. Like, this is not going away. The sooner you can find peace within yourself, with re, despite results on, you know, on the charts for your business or despite the results of the deadlift that you're lifting or despite the results of the weight on the scale, there is nothing that will help you feel fulfilled if you can just tap into you know best and you have it all already. I wish that would be the thing I said to myself. So I didn't constantly, you know, it's always good, right? Where we learn the things we learn in the way we're supposed to learn them. But it would definitely have been nice (laughs) at the age of 16, at the age of 21, at the age of 22, as I felt like a crazy person, you know, never feeling like I fit anywhere, knowing that I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And I finding that peace inside as soon as you can in whatever way that is, it's just at some point you're going to have to find it. And so the sooner you can do that at any age, the better. Gosh, you are so wise <laughs> and for your age. And I know that makes me sound like I'm, um, I, I don't know. It's just, it's amazing. It really is. You, you've, you've definitely learned some big <laughs> lessons along the way and it's just been a awesome delight to chat with you and thank follow. you Andy jo. <laughs> oh yeah absolutely and, and where can people follow along to just keep track of your journey <laughs> of course yeah it's a little it's a wild ride so again my messy instagram is um just emily schramm my full name s-c-h-r-o-m-m and i think honestly you know one thing that i re- I guess back to that social media question that there's something about podcasting and conversations with people that allow others to see what's going on, like for real, for real, not just snapshot for real. So I think my podcast meathead hippie is where I'm really able to kind of express all of these thoughts and feelings, just like you're able to in a beautiful way. I think it really is my favorite place to connect with people. So I would say emilyschramm.com is where you can kind of find the podcast, where you can find the things that I do and the avenues that can be helpful, whether it's stress results or whether it's um, working out. But I think the best place is to just go to Instagram for now, at least. I mean, I'm on a good Instagram day. So <laughs> we'll, say, we'll say Instagram and then podcast. Go quick. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for your time, Emily. This has been so fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the show. Hit me up on social media to let me know what you think. I'm at Amy Jo Martin on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I want to hear your why not now moments so I can share them on the show. Just send me a note to why not now at amyjomartin.com. For show notes and other offers, you can visit amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email newsletter for exclusive content and announcements. A big thanks to Rock Salt Music for all of the tunes by the talented John Coggins. And of course, a hat tip to Richard Gruer for editing and producing the show. I'll see you next time. And until then, why not now? (laughs) 